Yeah, she was easy to find this time, Sergeant. Smiley, you think you got a blonde hidden in here? Sorry, sir. There are no blondes in here either, Sarge. Oh, no, sir. Right! Here's your precious rocket safe and sound. At least the part of it that matters. I'll get the film. It should be dry by now. Right. Set to go, Doc? Yep. Just bringing out the last will and testament of poor little Minnie here to science. You know, I can't be sure until I perform an autopsy, but there's certainly intense heat up there killed her. The thermometer registered 400 degrees at one point. Ah, uh, then Minnie always was a delicate creature. You know, it's the same with any sensitive female. Too much or too little of any one thing isn't good. You're diagnosing mice or people, Phil? My mice, of course, Steve. You know, mice are smart. You learn a lot about people from mice. Too bad some of it didn't rub off on you. Steve? Thanks. something, Tommy? No, but one of these tubes is leaking. Now I can't be certain of the rate of evaporation of trinamine. That must be a terrible blow. I wish I were a fuel expert, Toby. Or a super engineer like Steve. Why the sudden yearning, Phil? I thought you were convinced that you'd already achieved perfection. Well, as no American believes that. Well, we'd better go and report to the old man. He'll be getting impatient. Ah, oh, here they are. Did you find it all right? Got it right here, Professor, all ready for running. Fine, fine. The takeoff film is all ready. Mm -hmm. Oh, General, please forgive me my bad manners. Uh, gentlemen, General Hayes, who has spent the day with me, represents the Defense Council. This is Dr. Stephen Mitchell, our chief structural designer, head of our engineering department. How do you do, sir? How do you do? We were fortunate enough to borrow him from the United States government. I've heard great things about your work, Dr. Mitchell, both at White Sands and elsewhere. Dr. Philip Crenshaw, he's our head biologist. It is, of course, essential to establish the living conditions up there. Dr. Crenshaw, I know what great problems you have to solve. I'm quite sure you'll solve them speedily and efficiently. Thank you, General. And last but not least, Dr. Toby Andrews. He's our fuel expert. Oh, you're the chap who's burning up all those gallons and gallons of hydrogen hyperoxide. And I'll have to burn a lot more, sir. Because of me, there might even be a shortage of blondes in the world. <laughs> Excuse me, Professor. They are adding the projection room. Thank you. Uh, General, this is Dr. Frank, who is in charge of our mathematical work. How do you do? How do you do? And a more charming mathematician I could not imagine. Thank you. Well, if you're ready, we could go into the projection room now. This way? Yes. These are just general shots of the preparations prior to the takeoff, which you will see in a moment. The rocket is now 20 miles up. In a moment, we shall lose it. But the automatic cameras take over, and we will show you how the rocket sees the Earth the reverse side of the experiment, and how the passengers reacted to those conditions. The rocket reaches a height of over 200 miles before it starts returning to the Earth. Its trajectory has been carefully computed so that the instrument carrying knows its descent slowed by a series of automatic parachutes 
is aimed to reach Earth within a 30-mile radius of Deanfield. Yes, all this is most impressive. You say that rocket was uh, Mark 7? Yes, General, the seventh modification of its type and the most perfect. But of course, it represents only our first stage. We're now ready to go into AS-1. AS-1? Yes, sir. We believe that we can send a rocket into an elliptical orbit to become the first artificial satellite of our globe that circles the Earth for an eternity. Our blueprints are all finished. All we need now is your authorization to go ahead. Yes, Dr. Kepler, there are still a lot of financial and technical details to be gone into, and uh, that's going to take a little time. I shall be only too happy to answer all your questions, General, providing you give us the right answer at the end. Steve, I'm so excited. Do you think it'll be all right? Of course it will. After all the time and money they put into this, they've got to go through it. And the old man looks pleased. Thanks, Philip. I needed that. I'm jittery, just as though I had a share in all your important plans and schemes. Well, haven't you? At least to provide inspiration for Steve and some others. Will you excuse me, gentlemen? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a toast to Deanfield. 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 You all know what we've accomplished up to date. We have more than doubled the height reached by the Germans in 1944. And we have surpassed the distance achieved by the two-state rocket launched from the sands of New Mexico in 1949. You have all worked with ceaseless energy to achieve this. There are many nationalities among us, but only one team. I wish I could tell you that some of your sacrifices are over, but I'm afraid I can't. But I am happy to announce that after full consultation with the Defense Council and his inspection of our work, General Hayes has authorized us to proceed at once with our AS-1. <laughs> I thank you all for your loyalty and enthusiasm. Thank you, Steve. Toby, hmm? I'm sure you're thrilled by the news. Well, we all are, Mrs. Mitchell, but it's really Steve I'm happiest for. Oh, yes, he's deliriously happy. So am I. I would be if you'd get me a drink. I shall personally supervise the preparation of this formula. Hi, dear, you must be proud of your husband. This is a great day for all of us. You do believe in the team spirit, don't you, Mrs. Daniel? Absolutely. You know, some women might chafe under all these restrictions and tedious passes and regulations, but I love them. I feel as if we were in a besieged fortress. One of those places on the northwest frontier. The tribesmen howling outside and the rescue column three weeks overdue. Oh, yes, I've seen it dozens of times on the pictures. Have you really? Mm. I keep on telling the Colonel, Alfred, I say to him, I'm not one bit bored. I love every minute of it. Don't you? No, thank you. I loathe every minute of it. And with every minute, I loathe it more. I'm afraid that's altogether too technical for me, Dr. Kelper. Oh, I'm sorry, General. I have an idea. One, two, for me? How sweet of you, Philip. I sent Toby off, but he got caught in an exhaust blast or something. He's a scintillating boy, Toby. I'm sure he must have been weaned on liquid hydrogen. Oh, he bores me. Now, that's not a nice way to talk. He thinks the world of Steve would follow him to the ends of space. They deserve each other. Any minute now, I'm going to get a splitting headache and I'm going home. I hope your headache will be pretty bad, too. Yes. I already feel it coming on. Say that nine months will be ample, providing we have the necessary priority. Have I interrupted the masterminds? Do forgive me and do go on. I just wanted to tell my husband that I've got a headache and I'm going home, if it doesn't upset the security rules. No, no, I wouldn't dream of breaking up the party. I insist, Steve, you must stay. Oh, 
Off so soon? Yes, I think I've had enough. I've got a bit of a headache. It seems like an epidemic of headaches this evening. Oh. Well, take some aspirin, Toby. You'll feel better in the morning. And uh, tell the old man I've gone, will you? You must feel proud, Steve. Proud and happy. Happy? It's a very inexact word for a higher mathematician, Lisa. Don't make fun. Isn't it the only thing that counts? The achievement of the mind. The creative effort. I don't know. All I do know is that we can do almost anything with matter or energy. We streamline science, but as for the human being, we're still muddling around in the Stone Age, as far as our emotions are concerned. But I suppose you have it all neatly reduced to equations and theorems. Oh, yes. Very neatly. Uh, good night, Steve. And thanks. Good night, Lisa. Quite enough chances as it is. All right. But kiss me first. Let me tidy it up. Oh, no, 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 no. Leave it till the morning. Mrs. Donovan is happy when she's got something to do. And you didn't come back to tidy up. A mind reader. There are some minds I can read. Why am I so selfish? I should be happy now that... We got what we wanted. But I'm not. I know you're not. I wish I could help. She'll destroy you. I know she will. Not Stephen. What is happening already? I've noticed it. You're not a woman. You wouldn't know. But you can't destroy something you don't possess. Tonight, I had the feeling that she suddenly realized how utterly apart from Stephen's world she really is. So did I. Lisa, let me get you a transfer. To the United States, perhaps. Oh, no one need know the real reasons. And it will give you time to think your way out of all this. It's sweet of you to want to help me. But it's my own private battle. Running away won't help. You're like my own child, Lisa. Anything I can do. I know. If I want to have a shoulder to cry on, I'll come to you. You took your time, I must say. 
suppose the party was a lot more fun after I left. I didn't stay long. I took a walk. I wanted some air. Well, I'm glad you're back at last. I want to get some things straight. Please, Vanessa, it's two in the morning. I don't care what time it is. I've found it. Oh, you needn't stare. You know perfectly well it's the letter from Universal Electric. Oh, there's nothing sacred about it. And yet you hid it. You were afraid that I'd find Stop it. Stop it, Vanessa. You're being childish. Am I? Aren't you childish clinging to this job at army pay when you've got this offer at four times the salary? You know I can't quit. Slaves, that's what you are, all of you. Slaves in white overalls. You can't even blow your noses without permission from security. You knew what you were doing when you married me. I told you then that we might have to stay at Beanfield for several years. But the work was top secret. Well, suppose you did. I never dreamt it would be like this. I can't even choose my own hairdresser. I have to be content with one that's passed as a good security risk. Our letters are censored. They stick their noses into our pots and pans. They... Oh, I'd stand it if I knew you couldn't do better. But there's this offer and you simply ignored it. I have to finish what I start, Vanessa. How long will it take you to finish what you start? I don't know. Four years, five years, maybe less. Four years, five years, maybe less. Anyway, it's not really your job you're worried about. It's that precious Lisa Frank. Do you think I'm blind? How dare you walk out of me when I'm talking to you? Steve, I won't have you treat me this way. Go to bed, Vanessa. Oh, Steve. I only want the best for us. For you. Oh, if only you'd listen to me. If only... Go to bed. I thought you, uh... Oh, hello, Toby. Party all over? Some time ago. Oh, I just dropped by to uh, look in on Luella. She's expecting you now. How's the expectant father bearing up under the strain? <laughs> he hasn't got a thing to worry about, old boy. Luella's doing fine. They would have stopped picking out names. Won't be long now. Uh, as a matter of fact, I left the key of my bungalow in my overalls. Came to pick it up. What brings you here, Toby? Oh, I was on my way home when I suddenly had a crazy brainwave that by making certain changes in the ratio of the new fuel propellant I'm working on, I could double its power without increasing its quantity. I knew I shouldn't get a wink of sleep unless I stopped by to check it with Junior here. I wanted to see whether or not... I was on the right track. Well, at least I haven't locked myself out. Mm, you're lucky having your own quarters. We small fry in the black hole have precious little privacy. Right, Toby, I thought you had all the fun in the world there. Toasting marshmallows, exchanging boyish secrets. Good night. Good night, Toby. We'll retrace the path of the rocket on the Astra screen. Here. Over here. The instrument panel will show the height reached and the various stages at which the automatic instruments will begin their work. Dr. Frank will call out the figures and its course will be plotted on this chart. We are aiming at a distance of 1,075 miles above sea level. Why that figure, Professor? Ah, because at that height, we know the rocket will become a satellite of Earth. It will never return and will circle the globe once every two hours. We believe the three-stage rocket is the answer. After a vertical takeoff, the first unit will carry it up almost 260 miles. This will drop off and fall back somewhere into the Atlantic. The second unit takes over and carries the rocket to 760 miles. 
And after this drops off, the third and final section continues under its own power, which will carry it into an eternal elliptical orbit around the Earth. And you believe that later on, you can really achieve this on a larger scale? With my team, I am positive. Our calculations are decisive. Within two or three years, we shall be able to send up not only an instrument carrier, but a series of rockets containing the men and materials to build the first space station. You have the detailed report, sir. You know what we're trying to do. It still sounds fantastic to me to build more than a thousand miles up a space station. Have you considered the positions where we lose the race to get there first? An observatory that will at last pierce the secrets of space. Which will keep every part of the globe under constant surveillance. A stepping stone to the moon and to the planets to whole new worlds. And, if necessary, a launching platform for atomic weapons. I hope we shall never have to use it for that purpose. No, but it'll be available if necessary. Oh. I, too, share Professor Kepler's hope that our space station will only serve peace. But we have been spending tremendous amounts of our defense budget on your work, Kepler, and we must be prepared for both peace and war. Ready, Professor. If you will take a seat here, sir. Certainly. Already here, Steve. Mitchell fires the rocket from our forward control booth. Our nearest point to the launching site. Fifty seconds. Forty seconds. Thirty seconds. Twenty five seconds. Eighteen seconds. Seventeen. Sixteen. Fifteen. Fourteen. Thirteen. Twelve. Eleven. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Nine miles. Twenty-four point nine. Speed one hundred and eighty miles per hour. One eighty. Gyro pilot effective. Climbing at eighty-six degrees. Eighty-six. Acceleration three point five g. Three point five. Altitude sixty-seven miles. Sixty-seven. Speed nine hundred and seventy miles per hour. Nine seventy. Acceleration 6G. 6. Altitude 260 miles. 260. Speed 2040 miles per hour. 2040. Acceleration 8G. 8. Tail section disconnected. What's your reading, Steve? Steering jets active. Rocket now climbing 48 degrees, exactly on scheduled course. Altitude 520 miles. 520. Speed 4,211 miles per hour. 4,211. Acceleration 10G plus. 10 plus. Engines cut off. Why does it do that? We don't want to send it too far. Within a few moments, the center section will disconnect and the rocket motors in the nose section will be automatically turned on for about 15 seconds. This will increase the speed that has been reduced by the gravitational pull of the Earth. After that, no more power is necessary. Center section disconnected. Altitude 760. 760. Speed 5,000 miles per hour. 5,000. Maximum acceleration. Maximum. Altitude, 760. 
What is it, Kepler? What's happened? I can't understand. The 50 second boost. It didn't seem to work. Stephen, come to the control room immediately. Speed constant. Altitude 650. 643. 640. 633. 633. 633. What's the answer? What does it mean? How does one reply to the unpredictable? I can't believe those are calculations, nor our instruments. Yeah, well, what's going to happen with that rocket up there? It'll stay up there at a height of 633 miles for years. Eventually, of course, it'll fall back to Earth. Does that mean total failure? Only a temporary one, sir. As long as the rocket stays up there, our automatic instruments will send out signals giving us valuable data. This is very disappointing. Let me have a full report as soon as possible. Yes, sir. It will break his heart. No, not Kepler. We'll just have to start over again, that's all. You don't know him as well as I do, Steve. For months now, he's lived on his nerves. And on hope. Uh, they're all waiting in the assembly hall. Uh, sir, I can't locate Dr. Crenshaw. What? He was supposed to stand by to check the animal reaction in the discarded sections. Well, I've looked everywhere for him, sir. I even picked up a couple of sergeants on the way. We searched every building and every room. And he hasn't passed through either of the gates. There's not a sign of him. Nor of Mrs. Mitchell. If what you just told me about Dr. Crenshaw and Mrs. Mitchell is true, it's very disturbing. Why? Because we're scientists, is that supposed to make us different from other people? That's the whole point. Two people had disappeared and something went wrong with the rocket. If this was a normal experimental station, we could send out a general alarm and get the press and radio to help us find them. But we can't. Not a word of this can leak out. I'll get a hand-picked man from military intelligence here as quickly as possible. And of course, no one is to leave the field. Yes, sir. I guarantee no one will. I came to... I came to see how you were. I'm fine. You mean you don't want sympathy? Well, perhaps I don't need it. May I sit down? Oh, please, forgive me. Don't you want to tell me about it? What are you driving at, Lisa? I mean... I mean that you're not being frank with me. Or with yourself. What do you mean? Steve, we worked together for almost two years now. I knew you weren't happy. Well... That's all over now. Slaves in white overalls, she called us. Maybe she was right. She was wrong, and you know it. Isn't that the greatest thing we're doing? Making the age-old dream of all men come true? Oh, Steve, you can't listen to the chatter of a spiteful woman who... I'm sorry. I 
forgot you loved her. No. I didn't love her, Lisa. Lisa wasn't that anymore. Why? I mean, why did you marry her? I just came along, a big American scientist and a hush-hush job with the government. Top secret stuff. She could see herself moving in high circles, living a very glamorous life. It's an old story, Lisa. A guy with a one-track mind, nothing but rockets in his head, meets a beautiful woman with something entirely different in hers. Steve. I guess it's all very funny if you can hang on to your sense of humor. Steve. You'll work things out. You'll find a way. Take this gentleman to Dr. Kepler. Right. You must realize my position, Major Smith. Dr. Smith, if you please. Doctor? Yes, I happen to be a doctor of science, Professor. Biologist. The last five years, I've been seconded to intelligence, but biology is still my first love. I see. But you understand that anything to upset the work of our community here would be disastrous. Yes, of course. Will you? Uh, who do you think? It's a bad habit, I know. I find it stimulating, even if it is <coughs> old-fashioned. Yes, I understand. Officially, I'm here as a replacement for Dr. Crenshaw. I've allotted you Dr. Crenshaw's bungalow. Oh, have you? Good idea. I'm a great believer in atmosphere. Punches may not be scientific, but sometimes they pay off. Just going down to the village. Very sorry, sir. Against regulations. I've got a pass. Sorry, sir. This is only valid for getting in, not for getting out. Hmm. Giving me a black mark, Sergeant. No, sir. Just making a note that you tried to get out, and when? I see. Is this the only gate? No, there's one at the other side of the compound for lorries and vans, but it's guarded the same as this, sir. Quite a little fortress, aren't we? And unlikely that anyone could get past you two. Not if he's flesh and blood. Well, it gives one a real feeling of security, knowing there are chaps like you around. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Dr. Fink. Can you spare me a moment? Oh, dear. What is it this time? Oh, big one. Tell me, what's the fuel consumption of the instrument carrier? Well, it's a three-stage rocket, as you know. It was built to exact scale. One-tenth of the four-stage rocket we plan to build. Yes. It carried 52.5 tons of fuel for the first stage. Of this, more than 90% would be used in the first 84 seconds. And what about the second and third sections? The second would only use 7.7 .7 tons, and the third, 9 tons. I see. Now, suppose that a certain proportion of the fuel for the third stage should be inoperative. Hmm? What do you mean? Well, I'll say that by mistake in loading, the final part of the rocket had only six or seven tons of fuel instead of the necessary nine tons. Could that have caused the failure? It might. But that's impossible. The loading was supervised by Dr. Mitchell himself. Every tank was checked by him. Yes. Yes, that's what I meant. 
Just what did you mean? I thought you came here to help us and... You mean that I haven't asked you any questions about Crenshaw and Mrs. Mitchell? Don't worry, Dr. Frank. Maybe I'm getting nowhere. Or maybe I'm getting somewhere by my own devious route. I'm a great believer in patience. Rather depressing, all Crenshaw's personal belongings still around. Soda? Thanks. I feel as if I might bump into his ghost at any moment. Ghost? I should say he's very much alive. Do you think so? Somehow I smell death in this room. My grandmother was Irish, you know. Oh, that's nice. Oh, well, they may be wrong. Crenshaw was always a chap for looking after number one. I often used to tell him when we were at Cambridge that if he Where? ever... Cambridge. We were at the same college, you know. Then Dr. Crenshaw must have been the most remarkable student. I happen to know he was at Oxford. Oh. <laughs> Oxford? He can't have been. You were never at college with him. Why are you lying about it? Now, look here. Ever right. since you came here, you've done nothing but pump me and the rest of us. Just what are you up to? I laid that trap for you deliberately, because I wanted your reaction. I know Crenshaw was at Oxford. Oh, very good. That's an easy way out. But I also happen to know that he took a degree in Germany, a degree in engineering, a fact which he was very careful to conceal. Andrews, I'm here to find out what happened to Crenshaw and that precious rocket of yours. And I want help. I don't, I don't understand. It, it's all so confusing. Yes, it always is. Life isn't laid out in neat patterns. But every now and then, you come across pieces that fit together. It's your duty to try and help me find those pieces. If there's anything you know. Yes. It's a funny thing. It was the night of the party. I'd gone back to the laboratory to do some extra work on a new fuel formula. Yes. And there was Philip. He said he'd forgotten the keys of his bungalow. But he hadn't. It was a lie. Was it not? You asked me to come here, Smith. You got something on your mind. Let's have it. Hmm? Oh, yes. Yes. Dr. Mitchell, you were the last person to enter the rocket before the takeoff, weren't you? I believe so. Can't you be a little more exact? After all, you are a scientist. Well, uh, three hours before the takeoff, around uh, nine o'clock, I made my final checkup of the radar installations and the fuel tanks. Alone? Yes, quite alone. The mechanics were busy with the platform and the exhaust pit. You secured the airlock, and the rocket was then ready for the takeoff. Hmm? That's right. Dr. Mitchell, did anyone else have access to the inside of the rocket after you left? Well, the airlock could have been opened, yes. But it's a rather lengthy and cumbersome operation. Yes. Yes, I see. This is a complete diagram of the rocket, isn't it? Yes. And these... Are the fuel tanks? That's right. Good. Now, we've established that the loss of two or possibly three tons of fuel from the nose section would prevent the rocket from reaching its planned height, correct? But there was no such loss. I told you that I checked the fuel tanks myself. There was absolutely no possibility for any leakage. 
No accidental possibility. Smith, you've got a little man running around loose inside your brain, just dying to get out and say something. Why don't you let him say it? Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Please believe me, that little man is only doing his duty. Well, let's hear him. He's suggesting that you open the valves and let two or three tons of fuel escape through the pump line. The original container is still in the exhaust pit. And you had actually more fuel on the launching site than was necessary for the complete supply. And does your little man say why I went to all this trouble? Well, he's got a theory. A very nasty theory. Murder. <laughs> And shrewd, too. He's suggesting that you trapped your wife and Dr. Crenshaw together, killed them, and hid the bodies in your house. Then when dusk fell, you took them to the launching site. One of the trolleys was seen at the back of your house. You had more than an hour alone at the launching site. You drained the fuel tanks, stuffed the bodies inside, Now, they're up there in space, circling the Earth. They'll stay there for decades if the calculations are correct. Your calculations, Mitchell. The perfect murder with no inconvenient bodies lying about. day. Going around accusing other people of murder must be pretty tiring. You need some sleep. This won't take long. Something I want to tell you. Something that may even make you change your mind about not talking. It's about Crenshaw. Did you ever know that in addition to his qualifications as a biologist, he also had a degree in engineering? So? He's a traitor, Mitchell. A traitor and a spy. He was paid to steal your secrets. Why did you wait until now to tell me this? I hoped you might tell me first. And I thought your wife might have been his confederate. If they're both alive, I'll find them. But if they're dead, and you kill them. You must tell me. We've got to know what happened to Crenshaw. You're from military intelligence. You find him. I think I found it. Found what? The cause of the rocket's failure. I think it was. Steve. At 
Lisa. Haven't you heard about me? I haven't heard anything. You haven't heard that I'm a murderer? No. Smith has developed a very pretty theory that I killed Vanessa and Philip. That I drained some fuel out of the rocket, then pushed their bodies into it. And now they're up there, circling the Earth. But... but why? Oh, they've got a lot of circumstantial evidence. If I were in their places, I suppose I might even believe it myself. But they can't believe that. Look, Laser. Kepler knows me as well as anybody. He's not even sure I didn't do it. He, he must have been just browbeaten by that awful man, Smith. However he's done it, he's done it. But what's going to happen? What are they going to do? Well... Apparently, I'm too important to the whole project to be dispensed with immediately. When they've completely picked my brains, I suppose I'll be tried for murder. They can't do that. They can't. Oh, yes, they can. It's like sentencing a man to hang in five years' time, isn't it? Death deferred. Steve, I think I've got the answer. You must listen to my theory. Now, look. You remember that we were worried about the fuel supply for the 15-second boost? Yes, but we solved that with the super plastic that replaced the aluminum alloy. Yes, but we forgot one thing. The evaporation quotient of hydrogen. Yes, but the test showed that they... No, the tests were made under simulated space conditions. But suppose... Just suppose that we underestimated friction at that speed and that altitude. Now, suppose the fuel pump didn't break, but was choked. The supply of the propellant would be sufficient to cause the rocket's failure. You see, it's a distinct possibility. And if... And if you... Please, I didn't care. I love you so much. Don't you see? We can work it out together. Prove them wrong. You and I. Yeah. Maybe we can. And I think Lisa's theory is completely feasible. And it's the only one we have that fits all the known facts. It would be the answer to a lot of things. Would it explain the disappearance? of Crenshaw and Dr. Mitchell's wife. There was no way for them to get out of Deanfield. You want conclusive proof, is that it, Smith? Well, I've thought of a way to silence even your inquiring little mind. A simple way. Bring back the first rocket with a second rocket. Only somebody's in that second rocket. Me! Stephen, you're mad. I can't let you talk this way, Stephen. We're not ready to think about things like this yet. Our spacesuits are still experimental. We don't know the effect of pressure and acceleration on the human body organism. We've sent up fruit flies, guinea pigs, mice, and monkeys. We know enough to take a calculated risk. But not enough to involve a human life. Well, it's my life. And not a very good one unless I can prove the bodies are not in that rocket. Your life happens to be my responsibility. I value it more than your attempt to prove a point. Professor Kepler. Ever since I've come to Deanfield, I've had one idea in mind. And that's to design the first rocket ship to carry a human being. With what we know now, I'm confident that I can do it. Yes, I am trying to prove a point. But not the one that you're thinking of. That's only incidental to the main point, the conquest of space. No one knows better than you the progress we've made toward that end. And no one knows better than you. But until a human being, a trained human being, makes the first rocket flight, we're at a standstill as far as future development is concerned. Now, who better to go than an accused murderer who 
who was also a scientist. Dr. Mitchell, I shall recommend that permission be granted. <laughs> Darling, I was frightened, too, thinking about it. It has to be done, for your sake and mine. And, and if anything should happen? It won't. It won't. But I don't want to talk or think about death. Not on a night like this. <laughs> more than 24 hours to go. Well, I think we can safely say that the security arrangements are foolproof, can't we, Colonel? They were always foolproof. And yet, two people disappeared, either into space or into the outside world. I thought you definitely excluded the second possibility. Yes, I thought I had. There's a nagging little voice that keeps on saying, what if you were wrong? What if you were wrong? I knew, of course, that Mrs. Mitchell wasn't happy here. She told my wife that she hated the place. Still, whatever happened, I know it wasn't because my men fell down on the job. Why, except for one man, I've had the same security personnel for three years. Well, that's as it should be. What did you say? I said, except for one man. I've had the same security for... One time. man? Why didn't you tell me before? Who was that one man? The Corporal Rogers. Where's he gone? Well, his enlistment was up and he went home. What's all the excitement about? Hurry up, Colonel. I want his address. Right, I'm looking for him. Give it to me. I'll find it. Corporal Rogers? Yes. Toby, I want to talk to you. Come in. It's about Steve. Toby, he can't make the trip alone. I want you to volunteer to go with him. Toby, I'm only asking you to volunteer. I didn't ask you to go with him. Toby, please. Lisa, you can't ask me to do this. No matter how much you love Steve, you mustn't go with him. But I've got to, Toby. I've got to.
Yes, number 24. Mm -hmm. Down there. I'd like to speak to Mr. Rogers, please. Well, I'm afraid that's impossible, sir. See, my husband was killed a week ago. Killed? In an accident. He was in a car with a friend. They skidded. Dave was thrown from the car. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Rogers. This friend, could you give me his name or address? His name? Well, I know Dave called him Phil. He was on the same station as Dave, but I only saw him the once, the day he called for my husband. Would you recognize him? Yes, that's him, all right. He didn't have a lady with him by any chance, did he? No. All I know is Dave had some sort of a business deal with him, something to do with a boat. What sort of boat, do you know? Well, I did hear this Phil mention something about Whittingley and a trawler. What's all this got to do with Dave? I can't stay to explain now, Mrs. Rogers. I'm in a great hurry, but you'll be most helpful. Thank you. Little place. Latest thing in space wagons. Steve, how are you going to do it? Do what? Bring back the other rocket. Well, what I have to do is synchronize my speed with the AS1, move alongside, secure it with the magnetic grapples, and then I can bring it back using the extra parachutes for a double landing. Sounds anything but easy to me. Still, if you say, it can be done. Let's say that, uh, according to the best scientific calculations, it's entirely possible. How'd you feel? You really want to know? No. I guess I feel the same way. Still, I might as well get used to it. What are you talking about? Look, Steve. I don't know why you're really doing this, and I don't care. But scientifically, I'm just as much involved in this experiment as you are. After all, two of us would stand a better chance of staying alive and coming back that way. You're crazy. Oh, fine, then it's all settled. Yes, I want the whole district sealed off. Twelve search parties at least. Now, this is top priority. Where? Seaview Cottage. Are you sure? No, I'll go myself. Send a couple of squad cars to follow me. Oh, they seem to have located them. Some cottage on the cliffs about half an hour outside Whittingley. Will you lead the way? I will. Only six hours to go. Have you checked everything, Steve? We'll give it a final check-up in a few moments. Just thought I'd say goodbye now. Well, good luck. And my best wishes for the success of your enterprise. Thank you, John. Would you excuse us for a moment, sir? Yes, of course. I just saw Lisa, and uh, she asked me to tell you she won't be here for the takeoff. She thought you'd understand. Of course. Steve, it's still not too late. Won't you reconsider the matter? We can't disappoint Dr. Smith, can we? If uh, anything should go wrong, you'll uh, take care of Lisa, won't you? Oh, I can manage the rest, boys, with Dr. Frank's help. Oh, you better check the intercom line. Right, sir. I've changed my mind, Lisa. I'm going with him. Toby, you can't. We made a bargain. I made a mistake. Now you're making a bigger mistake, Toby. Whether Steve succeeds or not, there always been another day for someone else to follow him. But right now is what matters to me. Can't you understand? I belong with Steve. And it's my life. And I would rather die with him than live without him. Toby, please. There isn't much time. Oh, 
much further, is it? Just over the brow of the hill, sir. You can't see it from the road. told me we were going to America. West, not east. Ever since we've left Deanfield, we've been dodging and hiding and running away. From what? Do you think I'm an idiot, Philip? And now you have to go and bring me to a hole like this. Now listen, Lesa. You're in this whether you like it or not. There's no time for stupid argument. But now for the last time. No! Very well. Have it your own way. You're a stupid girl, Nessa. Where I'm going, I'll I be... know exactly where you're going and what's going to happen there. Dean Field was a prison and you got me out of that. But I'd be mad to change it for another prison, even if it has got 200 million people in it. Then it's goodbye, Nessa. Sorry it had to end like this, Nessa. But you know too much for me to leave you behind. You had your chance, but you wouldn't take it. You can only hang a man once, Crenshaw. In your case, it's a great pity. Operator. Operator, I want Dean Field 8266. This is official. What do you mean they're disconnected? I must get... No, I have not got an authorization from London, but we... All right, never mind. Take good care of him. Yes, sir. Please, God, I shall be in time. Oh, Operator, I think I'll call the police. Dr. Andrews, ready yet? I think so, sir. Jones and Gray came out of the cubicle when I went to fetch the new valve. All right, let's have a helmet. Toby, don't leave here until the takeoff motors are switched on. After that, it'll be too late anyhow. And please, don't let anybody come in here until then. Please, all right. Thank you, Toby. Steve? 30 seconds to go, Professor. The uh, first few minutes after takeoff are the critical period. We still don't know how the human body will react to the tremendous acceleration. We've done everything in our power to protect Mitchell and Andrews, but. Uh, Activate takeoff boost. 
Not alone, sir. Excuse me, sir. I couldn't help it, Professor. Stop. We must bring the rocket back. Lisa, she is taking Toby's place. She's up there. Climbing at 87 degrees, speed 184, altitude 25 miles. Hello, Dean Field. Hello, Dean Field. This is Mitchell calling. This is Mitchell calling. Come in, Dean Field. Come in, Dean Field. Hello, Mitchell. Hello, Mitchell. This is Dean Field. This is Dean Field. Take off entirely successful. No trouble with fuel supply or pressure chamber. Toby blacked out, but coming to now. We are both strapped in and must stay this way until first section disconnects. Nothing we can do now, not until the third section's on its own. How did you find them? How did they get out of Deanfield? You gave me the clue, Colonel. I did. I blame myself for my own stupidity. Crenshaw had something very valuable to sell, and he wanted to find the right customer. Mrs. Mitchell was as much taken in by him as we were. And now she's dead. You sent them up there. Them? Lisa's with him. To prove that you're wrong. AS-2 calling Deanfield. AS-2 calling Deanfield and standing by. Come in, Deanfield. Come in, Deanfield. Steve, listen. I know about Lisa. 
You must return. We'll pinpoint you with radar and pick you up wherever you land. Must return. Smith has found them. I promise you everything will be all right. Our speed now 5,000. Must disconnect center section. Final section lining with stronger absorbance. Rocket principle all right. Only needs strengthening. Someone else must follow us so that all this won't have been in vain. Lisa, it's free. We're turning back. Did you hear that, Professor? It's all right. We're turning back. We're turning back. 